The topic of my talk will be uh, novel assays of uh, the function of von Willebrand disease. <clears throat> and before we uh, go to that, just let's do a little bit of a background. Uh, obviously, the goal uh, to measure uh, activity uh, is to make the diagnosis, but the, uh, the laboratory assays should always be interpreted in the light of the clinical symptoms as well as the inheritance pattern of the patients. Uh, so these are the three legs of the, diagn the diagnosis rests on. Uh, today we'll only focus on uh, laboratory uh, assays. And as you've seen in the previous talk, all the activity uh, measurements uh, reflect one or the other uh, functional epitopes or binding sites of the von Willebrand factor protein, which uh, of uh, uh, the structure of which is uh, uh, shown on this slide. Um, you know, we, as you all know, uh, this is a very large multimeric protein, um, and uh, the GP1B binding site on platelets, as well as the collagen binding site, is reflected by measuring uh, receding cofactor activity and uh, uh, collagen binding, both of which are uh, very much dependent on the size of the multimers in contrast to the uh, factor VIII binding site, uh, which is measured by the factor VIII binding assay, as you, see, as, as you saw in the previous talk, uh, that is not dependent on the multimeric size. And of course, you can image the multimer distribution itself, which reflects the integrity of the dimerization uh, here and the multimerization uh, sites, as well as the cleavage of the protein without going into any of those uh, details. Uh, this is a list of the uh, functional assays that we have. Uh, many of the, these assays are, on the top are available in most clinical laboratories that run a coagulation division, whereas um, the rest of the assays, you might call them confirmatory assays, are only available in reference laboratories. But as far as novel uh, developments, that really pertains to the von uh, Willebrand factor, recessing cofactor assay only, which we will focus on for the rest of this talk. Now, the recessing cofactor assay suffers from a number of uh, disadvantages. It's very insensitive. A limit of detection is sometimes as high as up to 20 percent, but it's, it never goes to below 10. So that means. Uh, in, and the patients who have low levels is where we would need this information the most, and it's not available uh, because the, uh, the assay is insensitive. It is also very imprecise. Uh, co coefficient of variation goes up to 30 percent. Well, that means that if we would only repeat the test um, enough times in anybody uh, in this room, uh, we could uh, find low levels. Uh, suggesting maybe von Willebrand disease, which is obviously false. Now, this imprecision comes in part from the Ristocetin itself, which is an imperfect uh, laboratory uh, ingredient, unstable. There is quite a bit of batch-to-batch -batch variability, and also the platelets uh, similar. There is much batch-to-batch -batch, uh, variability, even if there are lyophilized. And also, there is some intrinsic imprecision of the assay. In addition, <coughs> um, Remember that the ristocetin uh, cofactor assay is really triggered by, the, uh, by an artifact. Ristocetin is an antibiotic that was incidentally found uh, to bind von Willebrand factor and, and triggers uh, this, this assay. Uh, but not surprisingly, uh, several uh, genetic variations uh, shown on the bottom and highlighted on, on the slide were found that affect the ristocetin binding site on the protein uh, giving you a falsely low ristocetin uh, cofactor activity, whereas these patients do not bleed. Their, uh, fact, their, their uh, von Willebrand factor in vivo is physiologically completely normal. Uh, <clears throat> so highlighted is the uh, proline 1467 serine substitution. If you could remember that number, it will come up again in this talk. Now, uh, I would also point out that this is not an insignificant problem in certain populations, such as the African Americans. These uh, variations are, affect more than half of the population. So wh what do you do with a 
an assay that is falsely wrong in half of the population. So I would, this is all uh, this is just to serve to point out that these new assays really address and to a large extent solve a very significant diagnostic problem that we have struggled with for the last several decades. <clears throat> uh, now, evolution is a branching process, and this is no different for the evolution of the resuscitating cofactor assay. Uh, uh, one line of, of uh, uh, development addressed the uh, resuscitating cofactor assay itself. They tried semi-automation and then uh, auto autom to full, fully automation, but they still use platelets and resuscitating. Uh, whereas uh, another line of innovation used an, a monoclonal antibody that mimics the surface of the uh, GP1B alpha on platelets. And this assay uh, can be used now without platelets and without ristocetin. Uh, uh, whereas the final uh, line of, of innovation uses a recombinant fragment of the ristocetin 1B alpha. Uh, some of these assays still use ristocetin to trigger the reaction, whereas uh, the newest ones. Uh, take advantage of a mutation that they, they uh, use a mutant um, recombinant GP1B alpha that recapu recapitulates the spontaneous binding of uh, GP1B alpha to von Willebrand factor that you see in patients with platelet type von Willebrand disease. Now, uh, these are the assays that are now also commercially available, so we will put some special focus on. On, on these assay tasks, but before we do, uh, we have to remember that all these assays use very different principles in uh, the measurement. So it was obvious that we should not call them uh, Ristocetin cofactor assay that we used to call the origin assays. So the uh, ISDH SSC uh, von Wurabend factor subcommittee came up with a recommendation which is now accepted and, and uh, official. Uh, for the nomenclature of these new assays. We still call Ristocetin cofactor assay all the old uh, uh, versions that use both platelets and Ristocetin, but we call uh, GP1BR all assays that use a recombinant GP1B with Ristocetin uh, triggering it, whereas we call it GP1BM for the mutant version, uh, and the fact that an antibody is used is reflected in the nomenclature, as you can see. So obviously R for ristocetin, M for mutant. Uh, now unfortunately, there's not um, one new assay, but there's multiple versions of this. This is a very busy slide, not meant to be read, only to indicate complexity. Uh, each row is a publication of one of these uh, assays. Now the, these are the ones that use ristocetin. And each column is an attribute that, as you can see, is all different in these assays. Now, only two of these are commercially available, so let's take a look at those. Both are uh, marketed by uh, IL, uh, one uh, for the ACL top platform, the other one for the AccuSTAR. But as you can see, they all use different codes uh, to capture the von Willebrand factor. They, use, they both use ristocetin, but the concentration is not disclosed. Uh, and so on, so there are differences. But we should remember that these uh, uh, now show a spectacular um, uh, limit of detection. They are very sensitive. Uh, the AccuSTAR goes below 1%, which is absolutely unheard of in the old days. Uh, uh, same or similar, but maybe not as uh, complicated for the uh, GP1BM versions. Uh, these are published uh, versions, two of them. Uh, are commercially available, uh, which is really one only because the second one marketed by Immuno, not marketed yet, it's, it's only in development by uh, Immunocore. Uh, the one by Siemens is available in m many, m maybe I should say most countries uh, in the world. Unfortunately, it's not yet available in the United States. Hopefully that will uh, change soon. And as you can see, uh, the limit of detection is again uh, very good uh, with a uh, good precision uh, of, the, of, of this assay. Now, 
the automatic question when you see all these assays using different reagents, different principles uh, of testing uh, becomes how do they relate? Do they measure the same thing? How do they relate to each other and the old Risto-Seating cofactor assay? So try to answer the question. We came up with a uh, large uh, um, international uh, comparison assay called the Compass VWF. And as you can see, each column here represents one of the laboratories participating. Each row, uh, one of the new assays highlighted are the ones that are commercially available, uh, but some laboratories also used house-made uh, assays. Uh, but the sam oh, these are the uh, cities uh, that the laboratories are situated in throughout Europe and the United States. Uh, for me, so as I was reviewing this, I was looking for other examples of international collaboration, and uh, I would like to share what I found with uh, those of you who are still awake. Uh, this is uh, some recent past, but we can also... Uh, look at our future, Portugal. the Portugal, uh, Italy, uh, uh, and so on. So I, I guess at least some people were awake. So let's go back to the, uh, uh, our samples. So every laboratory were distributed the same set of samples that were, uh, that were all blinded, uh, almost 100 of them. Uh, this slide shows you the distribution of normal samples and patient samples. Um, maybe I would again point out the 1467 one that was included as a, a recombinant protein taken up in a type 3 plasma. <clears throat> and these are the mutations that were included. All uh, these, uh, every sample that we chose was a pa uh, from a patient who was molecularly characterized. So we knew exactly what they had. Uh, 11 type 1 and a total of uh, 21 type 2 patients in addition to the normal controls and the type 3s. And then f this is the type of uh, regression analysis that you get with this sort of exercise. As you can see uh, on the x-axis, uh, you have the old risto-seating cofactor assay which was performed by each laboratory and each dot represents a mean of a sample uh, through, uh, across these laboratories and on the y-axis you see one of the newer assays in this instance it's the Innovance uh, which is the GP1B AM assay S and then uh, it's nice to find that the, 50, uh, the 1467 uh, variant is indeed low in the old assay if you look at it it's about 20 percent whereas in the new assay it's close to 50 percent so the false uh, low uh, problem uh, seems to be uh, seems to have been solved. Uh, this is uh, the same if you use the ELISA version of the same assay, uh, and also the same, uh, of course, if you use the antibody uh, assay, uh, which does not use risocetin. However, uh, if you use uh, even if uh, the recombinant version, uh, an assay that is triggered by the uh, by the risocetin as in an IELTS uh, version of the new assay, you still have identity, uh, which means that they both are false, falsely low. Uh, on the other hand, the majority of these uh, samples that you've seen uh, through these curves uh, are very close to identity. <clears throat> uh, I guess some more examples. Let's see. Check out uh, Austria, uh, Finnish. Okay, uh, uh, now the beauty of this exercise is that uh, you, not, you can not only compare these assays to each other, but since you know the molecular uh, changes, you know what the truth is, so you can uh, run a rock analysis, and as you expected, um, for the activity, the optimal cutoff is somewhere around 30% between normals and abnormals. And for the specific activity, which is a, a ratio of the activity versus the antigen, which was also measured by each laboratory, is around 0.6. Um, um, you can also uh, put this in a graph version uh, in which you see this is the specific activity, so the ratio normally close to 1%. Um, on the x-axis, you see the old risk cofactor assay. On the y-axis, one of the newer assays. So in an optimal world, each normal sample, normals in green, 
uh, and also each type one sample, those are the yellow ones, should fall in the right upper corner, meaning that both assays had a uh, above the cutoff uh, in, in, with the dotted uh, lines. Uh, uh, ratio, whereas all the abnormals, those are the squares, should fall in the left lower corner, uh, quarter. So that means all the, uh, the ones that are in, in the uh, two other quarters are falsely classified. In this case, Innovance got wrong two of the type two patients, which is still much better than the original assay, which got uh, wrong uh, or misclassified a number of other ones. Now the star. Uh, as you can see, uh, had cl classified all the type 2s correctly, but that, that means for the type 2, it has a very good sensitivity, but that comes at an expense of specificity because it also classified as type 2 many of the type 1s, uh, and so on. Uh, if you look at the antibody assay, for instance, that got all of the type 1s correct, so that's a very good specificity for type 2, but that is at the expense of sensitivity because several um, of the type 2s are misclassified. Uh, uh, as far as the, the performance of the assay, uh, variability uh, was pretty good. Of course, it's much easier to measure precisely normals if you use patient samples that are lower, the variation, the percent variation is always higher. Uh, maybe I should just in one sentence point out that this type of uh, coefficient of variation is much different from the ones that are reported because this is not one sample measured again and again and again, but is a, a many samples measured a few times in different laboratories. So this is closer to a real life uh, coefficient of variation and all assays perform well. So in conclusion, uh, I think uh, many of these, uh, or these assays uh, as a group uh, are close to solving many of our problems with the over-resuscitating cofactor assay. They are more sensitive, more precise, they are very user-friendly, and they will very likely uh, replace the over-resuscitating cofactor assay. In fact, in many countries throughout the world, they already have uh, replaced it. However, they are not exactly equal, as you've seen with one example, and there are other examples that are under analysis. I didn't have time and didn't want to bring it up uh, yet. <clears throat> uh, so I think much remains to be learned about subtle differences between them, and therefore such uh, studies, maybe on a larger scale, are desperately needed, and then perhaps more than one assay will uh, be needed, even with the newer ones, for an optimal analysis. And finally, a few by Jim, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I like exit poll. <laughs> Go Asia, slow walk out. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't leave out Hungary. <laughs> now, of course, the question is, is anybody going to stay? So maybe Romania. <laughs> and with that, uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for the attention. These are the beautiful cities, and these are the uh, people who did the work that I'd like to thank.